All right, I think we're going to start. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to today's uh, SONA webinar. Um, as you all know, the webinar is designed to bring experts from around the world to give talks about their research as well as inspire the next generation about um, in areas of neuroscience. Um, and uh, at, at the same time, to kind of create collaboration opportunities between scientists from all around the world. Uh, and today, uh, it's exciting to have Dr. Bess Frost uh, from uh, San Antonio, Texas, who will be giving us the talk shortly. But before going into that, I'll give a brief bio about her. I'm sure she wouldn't want me to say a lot, but I'll nevertheless go ahead and say a lot about her. So Dr. Bess Frost is an associate professor at the Bishop Institute of for Longevity and Aging Studies at the University of Texas Health San Antonio. And uh, she obtained her undergraduate degree from the University of Texas, Austin, then went on to uh, pursue her PhD from the University of California, San Francisco in the laboratory of Dr. Mark Diamond, where she really pioneered work that ignited a now prominent area of research on tau propagation. And um, following that, she went to Harvard Medical School to work with Dr. Mel Feeney, where she made many exciting discoveries about tau uh, and how it uh, influences or kind of affect nuclear architecture. Uh, before moving to the University of uh, Tech, uh, Bishop Institute for Longevity and Aging to establish her research group, where she majorly focuses on the consequence of tau-induced disruption of nuclear and genomic architecture, and also development of screenable dr drosophila models of protein aggregation and uh, prion-like propagation. Uh, Dr. Bess has been a member of the Tau Consortium since 2017. She was designated as rising star in the University of Texas system. And she was also the recipient of the 2019 Presidential Excellence Award for Junior Research Scholar from the University of Texas, San San Antonio. And also a 2020 O'Donnell Award in Medicine from the Academy of Medicine, Engineering and Science of Texas. Actually, I came to know about Dr. Uh, Bess in 20. 14 after they published a very exciting work which was you know related to my phd work and uh, since then i've been following her work so without wasting much time i will give the floor to dr bez to tell us about her research well thanks so much dr Mina. that was a really nice introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak to the group um, so today I'll be telling you about our work on Alzheimer's disease and related tauopathies um, and the effects of tau on the nucleus and transposable elements. So Dr. Mina asked me to give an overview of my um, career trajectory um, to the group. So I was originally born um, in the Dallas, uh, I was actually born in Alabama, but I grew up in the Dallas area. I did my undergraduate research at the University of Texas. Some of this is repetitive since Dr. Mina just said it, but I'll give you a little bit more detail about um, how, why I made the choices that I made. Um, so when I got into undergraduate research, I worked in the lab of Dr. Sue Bergeson. I knew I was really interested in the brain um, and really I was taking any type of undergrad research opportunity that, um, that I could get. And um, she worked on the effects of chronic al alcohol exposure on the brain in mice. Um, so I really, really loved my time in her lab. I knew I wanted to continue working on the brain and I knew I didn't want to work with mice. Um, so when I went to graduate school at um, University of California, San Francisco, I worked with Dr. Mark Diamond. And um, that was my first time to start working on tau protein and Alzheimer's disease and related tauopathies. So, and, and all of that work was um, cell culture and biophysics, um, like structural biology type of experiments. So the major publications um, during my time in Dr. Diamond's lab really, you know, led to this conclusion or kind of the beginning of the study of the protein tau and how it has prion-like characteristics that can can partially explain how it spreads from cell to cell, how it propagates a misfolded conformation between cells. And while this work is now, you know, very well recognized and, and has led, has partially led to a whole new field in, in tauopathy research, at the time, it was really hard to get it published. People didn't believe it. One of our reviewers said, basically said, this is absurd. Um, <laughs> so it was a tough time. Um, 
but and one of the criticisms that we got is that we didn't show it in um, a mammalian system we hadn't shown that tau can actually spread from cell to cell in vivo and a, another question that i got at the time from a lot of people is like okay so tau can pathogenic forms of tau can spread between cells but how does it actually kill neurons in human disease so i was really interested in those questions when i went to pursue um, my postdoc so I ended up joining Melfini's lab at Harvard Medical School um, in Boston. And the reason why I really wanted to join Dr. Feeney was because she had developed um, some of the first Drosophila models of human neurodegenerative disorders, including um, tauopathy model in fruit flies. And I had seen from her previous publications that flies were very, that the, that the tau fly model was very good and um, allowed um, investigators to really determine causality in terms of connecting tau to neurodegeneration. And she's also a very prominent neuropathologist. So when I came to her lab, I knew that I would be getting to work with fly models of tauopathy as well as postmortem human brain tissue. So whatever we found in the fly, I could potentially um, determine if that was true in human patient samples as well. So that was very attractive to me. So during my time there, I developed in her lab, I developed expertise in um, Drosophila models of tauopathy. Um, I started working with human brain tissue. I um, learned bioinform some you know, bioinformatics skills and all of it was really focused on the effects of tau on the nucleus and how DNA is packaged within the nucleus and what the shape of the nucleus is. Um, so I started my, oh, at this, also at that time, um, I had two kids, uh, Charlotte and Davis. Um, this is a picture of them now. They were, they were babies whenever I was in Boston. Um, so th those were, these were my, my major life events uh, during my postdoc. At the end of 2015, I moved to San Antonio at UT Health San Antonio the, and the Barshop Institute for Aging and Longevity Studies. Um, I'm also affiliated with the Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Disorders. Um, this is an outdated picture of my group. Uh, we have about 10 members now, um, five students and two postdocs and two um, research associates. Um, this is the, the major work uh, from my lab so far. We've had uh, three publications since 2015. Um, I'm gonna be telling you about this work here, about how um, we found that tau activates transposable elements and how we have determined that that transposable element activation is a causal driver of neurotoxicity in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that it's also, that transposable activation is also druggable. Um, so this, <laughs> this data uh, obviously needs to be updated for 2020 um, with COVID-19. It's gonna change these numbers a bit. Um, but what I wanna draw your attention to is, um, so here, this, this, this graph is showing the proportion of worldwide deaths by cause in 2017. So you can see cardiovascular disease are the big front, front runner in terms of um, death um, in humans. Dementia is the fifth leading cause of death at a 5% um, of, of total proportion of deaths worldwide. Um, not all dementia is Alzheimer's disease, but Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is probably not four and a half percent, but it makes up a big chunk of that. So it's a major um, a cause of death worldwide. I was reading yesterday, I, normally this slide is about um, treatments in the United States for Alzheimer's disease, but I was reading yesterday about the current treatment approaches in Africa. Um, and I found that the, the treatment approach is very similar to here. Uh, to, to the United States. Um, so people with Alzheimer's disease have common symptoms um, such as delusions, sleep disturbance, depression, and anxiety um, that are treated by drugs that are used in many other um, disorders. So you have antipsychotics um, and uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression and things of that nature for the symptoms that come along with Alzheimer's disease. In terms of treating dementia that comes along with Alzheimer's disease, there are two major classes of drugs um, that are given to patients, uh, cholinesterase inhibitors and NMDA receptor antagonists. So what I really would like to stress here is that all of these 
therapeutic approaches, you know, drug-based approaches are treating the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. They are not actually targeting the disease process. So they don't cause less neurons to die. They don't slow down the death of neurons. They just allow some patients, because not all, not all patients respond to these treatments, um, to deal with the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease for some time. But they don't work in everyone, and they don't work forever, and they don't actually slow down neurodegeneration. Um, so in my lab, uh, we think that in order to have rational drug design for Alzheimer's disease, we need to understand what changes a healthy brain into an Alzheimer's, uh, an Alzheimer's disease brain. So we know the major neuropathological changes that happen in Alzheimer's disease. These are the amyloid beta plaques and the tau tangles that are the defining neuropathological hallmarks. Um, so this is Alwa Alzheimer and his patient, Augusta Dieter. So Alzheimer um, first met uh, Augusta Dieter at the Frankfurt Insane Asylum in the early 1900s, where she had been institutionalized for memory loss and delusions and temporary vegetative states. Um, after she passed away, he performed um, histopathological analysis of her brain and saw what he described as um, plaques and tangles. So we, um, while Alzheimer is really cre credited with the discovery of this disease, um, we now know that there was another neuropathologist at the same time, Oscar Fisher, who was in Prague. So Alzheimer was at the, the Munich Neuropathological School and Fisher was at the Prague Neuropathological School. The two institutions were major um, competitors. So um, after Alzheimer had published his work um, uh, on Augusta Dieter, anal analyzing Augusta Dieter's brain, um, his boss actually had uh, written a book and credited Alzheimer's with discovering Alzheimer's disease. He called it Alzheimer's disease. Um, and Oscar Fisher's work was pretty much ignored um, until uh, there was a, there, it was included in a publication in 1998, um, but wasn't really widely recognized until uh, Mich Michel Godier, who's a prominent um, Alzheimer's disease scientist, had gone through the archives in the Prague National Library and found his work again. So it's starting to be a more wide, widely recognized his contributions to the disease. He was arrested by the Gestapo and actually sent to a, a concentration camp where he um, passed away at the age of 65. So it's a very sad story and I'm very happy that he's beginning to get recognition. Anyway, here are some uh, neurofibrillary tau tangles. We now know uh, that they're made up of a protein called tau. Um, that were drawn by Alzheimer. And here are some neurofibrillary tau tangles that were drawn by um, Fisher around the same time. When you look at the brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you'll see these tau tangles alongside the amyloid beta plaques. And so someone has to have the tau tangles and the amyloid beta plaques to have neuropathologically confirmed Alzheimer's disease. So while the tau, tau is most well known for its role in Alzheimer's disease along, alongside amyloid beta plaques, um, pathological forms of tau are the primary um, neuropathological feature of a bunch of other disorders that are collectively call, uh, called tauopathies um, in the absence of amyloid plaques. So there are a bunch of tauopathies, more than what I have listed here, where you get aggregation of tau in neurons and sometimes in glial cells as well. Um, so toxic forms of tau occur in disorders that are not Alzheimer's disease. We know that tau dysfunction is sufficient to cause neurodegeneration because there are a group of um, familial frontotemporal dementias where patients have mutations in the tau gene. Um, these are two examples um, where the, the patients get tauopathies. So tau dysfunction is sufficient to cause neurodegeneration. Um, so a lot of work um, in the past has been focused on physiological forms of tau turn into pathogenic forms of tau. So tau is normally a microtubule binding protein. It binds to microtubules and aids in their um, stabilization. In the context, uh, that's the most well-known ro role for tau. We also know uh, based on the work of Dr. Mina and others that, uh, that uh, tau has a physiological function in the nucleus as well. But this is like the canonical you know, function of tau. 
in disease, physiological forms of tau become hyperphosphorylated and they um, aggregate into oligomeric form, pathogenic forms, as well as larger neurofibrillary tangles and other shapes of aggregate. So this is a big focus for drug development for tauopathy, either preventing pathogenic forms of tau from forming, or if there are pathogenic forms of tau already, uh, trying to clear those out of the brain. And I think these are you know, good strategies for, for treatment. However, um, if someone already has a significant burden of pathogenic tau in the brain, that pathogenic tau is doing things to the cell and it's perhaps too late uh, to just clear it out because you've already set off a sequence of toxic events. So in my lab, um, we're trying to figure out what pathogenic forms of tau are doing in the cell to kill it. So we're trying to connect the dots between pathogenic tau and neurodegeneration because we think that these are additional drug targets that could potentially be um, therapeutically targeted in addition to these uh, types of approaches that would be more upstream. The systems that we work in are fruit fly models of tauopathy. Um, we use mouse brain from collaborators, and we also use post-mortem human brain tissue. Um, so before I start, I, before I start into the actual data, I want to tell you um, about what you need to know to understand this work in terms of nuclear architecture. So if you imagine the nucleus, so this, the whole nucleus would be here. There's the outer nuclear membrane, the inner nuclear membrane, and then all of the DNA that's inside the nucleus. So the, the cytoplasmic space uh, through the acto actin cytoskeleton is actually connected to the inside of the nucleus. So you have the actin cytoskeleton on the outside, this link complex, which spans the nuclear envelope, and binds to this lamin nucleoskeleton, which lines the internal surface of the nucleus. It's, 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 a, it's an intermediate filament. And then highly compacted DNA called heterochromatin tethers to this lamin nucleoskeleton on the inside. So changes that happen in the cytoplasm have structural consequences on what happens on the inside of the nucleus. So, Leading up to this project, um, we already knew that pathogenic tau causes an overstabilization of the actin cytoskeleton. So you have an overly rigid actin cytoskeleton in tauopathy in um, fly models, mouse models, um, and you also see Hirano bodies, which are um, like actin bundles in tauopathies as well, human tauopathy. Um, as a postdoc, I had found that an overstabilized actin cytoskeleton will cause a weakening through the link complex, will cause a, wink, a weakening of the lamin nucleoskeleton. And you get involutions of a nuclear envelope when you have this weakened um, nucleoskeleton. And I also found um, that whenever the lamin nucleoskeleton is weakened, it causes detachment of highly condensed heterochromatin from the lamin nucleoskeleton, which causes the heterochromatin to become more open. So you don't get the proper type of gene silencing that you would normally get in heterochro heterochromatic DNA. So pathogenic tau was causing heterochromatin to become more open and genes that were supposed to be turned off in this way were becoming turned on. Now my work has, has totally been on the function of uh, of tau in the cytoplasm and how it's affecting the nucleus, but work by um, Elliot Bonifoy, Dr. Mina, Dr. Sarpel, and others have shown that loss of function of nuclear tau also affects heterochromatin packaging. So while that, this has not been a focus for me, um, it's probably uh, effects of pathogenic tau in the cytoplasm that are causing heterochromatin to unwind, as well as a loss of function of nuclear tau that's causing heterochromatin to unwind. So the work that I'm going to tell you about today is really what happens here that caught, like why is this relaxation of heterochromatin actually toxic to the cell? And to do this, um, we start off in a Drosophila model of tauopathy. So here we're expressing human tau, specifically in neurons. Um, this model, these models were made by my postdoc mentor, Dr. Feeney. They have a shortened lifespan. They have climbing and locomotor deficits. They have progressive neuronal death. So 
um, at day one of adulthood, there's no neurodegeneration, but if you age them to 10 days, you can start to see neurodegeneration and it, it gets worse with age. And they're well suited for genetic modifier screening. Um, so when I came to my postdoc lab, this was, this was how I became interested in the effects of tau on heterochromatin because these flies had been used in, um, for screening efforts and Dr. Feeney's lab had found that genes associated with maintaining heterochromatin structure modified tau-induced neurotoxicity in the fly model. One of the ways that we look at neurotoxicity is by tunnel staining. So for example, here um, is a control fly brain and here is a tau transgenic, a portion of a tau transgenic fly, fly brain in uh, neurons or neuronal nuclei are labeled in green here. And we can do a tunnel stain, um, which just shows up red in this example to see which neurons are dying um, at any point in time. So that's one of the assays that we use to look at neurotoxicity. All right, so back to heterochromatin. Um, if I have a chromosome here, I've label, labeled the areas that are constitutive heterochromatin in red. So these are enriched at the telomeres and then near the centromere and per pericentromeric um, areas. Constitutive heterochromatin has a lower gene, gene density. So there are more genes located on the chromosome arms than there are in the heterochromatin, constitutive heterochromatin area. And in general, genes that are located in these regions are expressed at lower levels because the DNA is very um, tightly packed around them. These, these areas of DNA are also highly enriched in transposable elements. So what are transposable elements? They were discovered by Barbara McClintock um, at Cold Spring Harbor. They are pieces of, D they are DNA sequences that are capable of moving from one place to another in the genome. And they come in two major classes. The retrotransposons, so if this is a, a, a piece of DNA, here's a centromere here. The retrotransposons are first transcribed into RNA. That RNA is protein coding and, or some of it is, and those proteins are used to reverse transcribe that RNA into a new copy of DNA. And then that new copy of DNA can insert into the genome. So with each mobilization event, you get an extra copy of that retrotransposon. The type two transposons are DNA transposons. These mobilize via a cut and paste mechanism. So they cut out of the genome and then hop to a new place. So when I first learned about these um, transposable elements, I thought that they were um, an oddity, like a genetic oddity of corn. I think I, I learned about them first in high school. And I was shocked when I found out um, the large proportion of transposable elements that make up the human genome. So in the human genome, about 25% are made up by introns and exons. Exons only make up 2% of the human genome. It's a staggeringly small portion of our genome that actually encodes the proteins. About another 25% is structural DNA. So this is microsatellites, highly repetitive DNA. And then 45% of the human genome is made up of transposable elements. So about 2% of those are DNA transposons. These are the type of transposons that um, cut and paste. And the rest are the retrotransposons where you're making RNA that's reverse transcribed to DNA that's then being inserted into the genome in a new location. So in the human genome, the DNA transposons, first of all, don't make up very much, only 2%, similar to the exons. Um, and they also are no longer mobile. They, they cannot move anymore because of all of the um, mutations and truncations that have happened over the course of evolution, they're not able to move. So the focus of my talk today is really gonna be on the retrotransposons because I think that their activation is more relevant um, to humans. So when you're thinking about retrotransposons, there are a few different aspects of this life cycle that, that you have to think about. First, we have the new insertions which would generate a mutation um, every time there was a, a mobilization event. You have to think about the um, DNA copies that are not yet inserted into the genome. These can be recognized as viral and, um, and cause an immune response. And then you have to think about the RNA and the protein that it encodes, which is also recognized as viral. Um, so transposable elements are thought to have um, gotten into our genome because of a, many viral infections over the course of evolution. Um, and those, those viral pieces got stuck in, in our genome and we have you know, 
developed ways to deal with them and even use them uh, for regulatory uh, purposes. All right, so the first thing that we did, we, we thought since I had previously shown that tau causes, since I and others had previously shown that tau causes heterochromatin decondensation and heterochromatin is one of the ways that transposable elements stay silent, we thought perhaps that pathogenic forms of tau could activate transposable elements through the effects of tau on heterochromatin. So we took the um, uh, control flies and tau transgenic flies, and we just did RNA sequencing to see if we could detect um, differences in the amount of transposable element RNA in brains of tau transgenic uh, Drosophila. So in red here, you can see all of the different transposons, uh, ret these are all retro transposons that are elevated in the brains of tau transgenic flies at the RNA level. This is unpublished data. We've recently looked in three different models of um, mouse tauopathy. So these are the RTG4510 model. Um, and we've analyzed the transposable element RNA levels in the brain in an age dependent manner. So at three months, six months and nine months. And here we're looking at RNA levels of four different families of transposable elements. The, um, the short um, interspersed nuclear elements, the long interspersed nuclear elements, the long terminal repeat containing transposable elements, which are very similar to exogenous retroviruses. Um, most of them are endogenous, they're called endogenous retroviruses, as well as DNA transposons. And we see an age dependent increase in um, all of these families, particularly the long terminal repeat elements, um, by nine months of age in this mouse model of tauopathy. So you can see here, um, it's mostly the long terminal repeats and among the long terminal repeats, it's mostly the endogenous retrovirus class of transposons that are elevated. Um, looking, I'm gonna go, because it's just showing you two other mouse models that we've analyzed. So the JNPL3 model of tauopathy, um, pathology is particularly prominent in the spinal cord in this model. So that's what we've analyzed. You can see um, a very early activation of um, long terminal repeat retrotransposons in this model, which gets worse by six months and then kind of stabilizes by 12 months. Again, endogenous retroviruses that are particularly activated in this model. In the PS19 model, so this is a different um, mutation, we're looking again at spinal cord, at four months and nine months, again, you see an age-dependent increase in particularly long terminal repeat um, retrotransposons, and it's the endogenous retrovirus class that's becoming activated. So three different mouse models of tauopathy, different tissues, different sexes, we're seeing the general trend that um, endogenous retroviruses and other retrotransposons are becoming activated in the context of tauopathy, which, ma which matches very well with what we've seen in um, the tau transgenic fly model. We had previously shown that retrotransposons are also increased at the RNA level in uh, brains of patients with human Alzheimer's disease. And then one of these primary tauopathies where you don't have any MLA beta, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy. So these are all of the retrotransposon or transposable elements that were elevated in tauopathy. And you can see here, HERV stands for human endogenous retrovirus. Again, it's the endogenous retrovirus class that's particularly elevated in the context of human Alzheimer's disease um, and primary tauopathy. So it appears to be very consistent across model systems. All right, so, so far I've told you that transposable elements are activated at the RNA level in fly, mouse, and human tauopathy. We wanted to know if transposable elements were actually jumping in the context of tauopathy. And to do this, we used a fluorescent reporter of transposable element jumping. So these were, these flies, this is in flies now. Um, these were, the reporter was created by Josh Dubnow um, a few years ago. So basically when you see green fluorescence, you know that a transposable element has inserted um, in the fly brain. So in control flies, we don't, brain, fly brains, we don't see very much reporter activation. However, we see significantly more green fluorescence in brains of tau transgenic flies, suggesting that a full mobilization is actually occurring in the context of tauopathy in the fly brain. We see that this is age dependent. So looking at GFP, this is reporter expression. 
at uh, day one of adulthood, when there's no neurodegeneration, we don't see any differences in transposable element mobilization. However, they become um, significant by day 10 of adulthood um, and are maintained into day 40 of adulthood. So not in flies, not only is our transposable element activated at the RNA level, but we think that they're actually jumping. So this would be causing new mutations in the genome. In terms of mechanism, we've looked into, you know, how is tau actually causing this to happen? Um, we've looked into two major layers of transposable element control in flies. Um, so I've told you before that transposable elements are kept silent at the transcriptional level um, due to their location in heterochromatin. Um, they're all, and we had previously shown that heterochromatin was more open in the context of tauopathy and that um, genes that were present in heterochromatin were becoming expressed. Transposable elements are also controlled post-transcriptionally by a type of small RNAs called pi RNAs. Um, ESI RNAs can also do this. So they're similar to micro RNAs, but they have some differences. So when a pi, R pi RNA uh, binds to a transposable element transcript, um, it can lead to, to the degradation of that um, transposable element transcript. So we investigated both of these mechanisms to see which, which one was most important in the context of tauopathy. Um, so we developed a nanostring code set. So nanostring is a platform for looking at, um, well, you can look at RNA transcript levels. We made a code set that recognized all of the transposable elements that we had found were um, elevated in tau transgenic flies that we could look at at once using nanostring. And so here I'm showing you data where we have introduced a loss of function mutation in heterochromatin protein one. So this is sufficient to cause heterochromatin decondensation. And I'm showing you um, RNA levels of all of these different um, transposable elements relative to control. So control here is set to one. Anything that's going up above the line are transposons that are elevated at the transcript level as a consequence of heterochromatin relaxation. So you can see a lot of them that are changing in tau, transgenic flies, are also going up whenever you just disrupt heterochromatin. So this allowed us to say that heterochromatin relaxation causally contributes to retrotransposon activation in the brain. So we could say that that the effects of tau on heter heterochromatin likely contribute to transposon activation. Now going to post-transcriptional regulation of transposable elements, the first thing we did was look at uh, levels of peewee protein. So pi RNA stands for peewee interacting RNA. Peewee is a protein that's very important, very central to pi RNA biogenesis. So looking at control versus tau transgenic brains, we see a significant decrease in peewee protein levels at the immunofluorescence and at the Western blotting, um, by immunofluorescence and, and Western blotting. Um, so peewee protein levels are decreased in brains of tau transgenic drosophila. And then what about these pi RNAs that peewee is so important uh, for making. So we did small RNA sequencing of control versus tau transgenic flies for, and we analyzed the pi RNA uh, por proportion of the small RNA sequencing. Everything in blue is decreased. So you can see that most of the pi RNAs that are differentially expressed between tau and control are depleted in the tau transgenic fly. So this is consistent with a, a decrease in peewee as well. So most differentially expressed pi RNAs are decreased in tau transgenic drosophila which is consistent with an increase in transposable elements. So to determine if, if decreased pi RNAs and peewee actually affect transposable element transcripts, we went back to our nanostring code set. We first looked at the expression levels of these um, transposable elements to see how they changed if we just knocked down peewee. So if we just knock down peewee in neurons, we see that many of these elements are significantly elevated in the brain in the absence of transgenic tau. Now going the other way, if we have tau transgenic flies and we overexpress peewee, so we bring those peewee levels back up, which presumably would bring pi RNA levels back up as well, we can significantly deplete the aberrant uh, expression of these retrotransposons in the tau transgenic flies, suggesting that tau-induced peewee depletion 
causally contributes to retrotransposon activation. Okay, so that's that tells us that there's a link between tau, PUE, pi RNAs, and transposable element transcripts, but it doesn't tell us if, if um, transposable element activation or PUE depletion actually matter for uh, neuronal death. So I introduced the tunnel assay to you earlier um, in the talk. Here we're, uh, it's a, a measure of neuronal death. So here we're looking at the number of tunnel positive neurons at, um, in adult brains of control, peewee knockdown and peewee knockdown flies. And we see that de depleting peewee in neurons is sufficient to cause um, a low level of neuronal death in the fly brain. When we take tau trans which have um, you know, a lot of neuro neuronal death at this age, and we overexpress PeeWee, we bring those PeeWee levels back up, we see significantly less neurodegeneration based on tunnel staining, suggesting that tau-induced PeeWee depletion causally contributes to neuronal death. So at the end of these experiments and a, a bunch of other experiments that I'm not showing in the interest of time, we could say that pathogenic tau disrupts two layers of transposable element control. First, transposable elements are activated because they're not being silenced transcriptionally, and tau is affecting the post-transcriptional control of transposable elements as well. So next we asked if tau-induced uh, retrotransposon activation is druggable. So I told you in the beginning that this class of retrotransposons that's being activated are called um, endogenous retrovirus called endogenous retroviruses because they're so similar to exogenous retroviruses. So we thought perhaps um, that a retroviral therapy could um, block retrotransposon activation and potentially suppress neurodegeneration in the tau transgenic fly model. And other investigators in the aging field, um, Steve Helfand and Josh Dubnow, had already used this um, compound uh, 3TC to decrease transposable element activation that happens as a consequence of normal aging in the fly. So there was precedent for us using this compound. 3TC is, is um, widely used for the treatment of hepatitis B and HIV. So it, it's a nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So it blocks this RNA to DNA step here. So we took the tau transgenic flies and um, that had this, this uh, GFP-based reporter of transposable element activation in them, and we fed them 3TC. So we have tau flies that are fed with vehicle, which is water, or 3TC. And we're looking here at the amount of um, transposable element jumping, so that's an actual insertion event, in the flies. So you can see here that the flies that are fed the, the reverse transcriptase inhibitor have less retrotransposon jumping. They also have less neurodegeneration based on um, the tunnel assay. So tau transgenic flies fed vehicle have, a, have you know, a lot of neurodegeneration. Flies fed the reverse transcriptase inhibitor have less neurodegeneration. Um, so this led us to the conclusion that tau-induced transposable element activation is druggable. So based on these data, and a lot of data that I'm not showing you in um, tau transgenic mice and in human Alzheimer's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy, um, we think that this is a viable strategy um, to try out in a clinical trial for human Alzheimer's disease. So we have our own data as well as um, the fact that 3TC is, is widely, has been prescribed since the 90s. Um, so it's been around for a very long time. We think it's pretty safe. Um, also results from antiretroviral therapy-based trials for Acardi Gutierrez syndrome and ALS are published. And um, these studies are showing a beneficial effect of the, of the antiretroviral therapy in these dis disorders. These two disorders, um, uh, feature transposable element activation as a part of their disease course. Um, so we were really excited to see the results of these trials. And um, these were part of, part of the reason why we decided to go ahead forward with 3TC. So we just received approval from our institutional review board to move forward on a clinical trial using repurposing 3TC in human Alzheimer's disease. Uh, my collaborators here on the um, 
clinical trial are Dr. Dr. Sullivan. She's a neuropsychologist who will be identifying patients and doing neuropsychological assessments, um, as well as uh, Dr. Nick Moosey, who is the director of our Pepper Center, um, which will be very involved with uh, running the clinical trial. And then Gabby Zuniga from my lab is an MD PhD student who um, has really been instrumental in developing the assays that we're going to be using for target engagement um, and looking at inflammatory profiles and things like that. Um, so our, our clinical trial is now on um, clinicaltrials.gov. I can tell you that I'm a, I'm a basic scientist. I had no experience in moving to human trials before this. Um, it's been a huge learning experience and I'm really, really excited to get it going. Um, so it's, it's a very small pilot. Um, so it's only 12, per, 12 participants. Um, they're going to be getting 3TC once daily for six months. Um, our primary outcomes are looking at uh, target engagement. So we're gonna be looking at reverse transcriptase activity in blood and cerebrospinal fluids um, from these patients. Um, we're going to be seeing how well 3TC gets into the brain um, of patients who are taking the drug. Um, 3TC is relatively more brain penetrant, penetrant than a bunch of the other uh, therapies that are used for Alzheimer's or for um, HIV, but uh, CNS penetration has never been uh, measured in brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And then we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, several other um, secondary outcome measures. We'll be looking at cognitive function, change in some um, fluid-based biomarkers of neurodegeneration and inflammation. So I'm really, really excited to, to get this started. And I hope that um, COVID-19 does not ruin my uh, trial. All right, so at the end of the day, um, kind of connecting the dots that I introduced to you in the beginning, um, we think that the effects of tau on the nucleus and heterochromatin are um, causing PWE and pi RNA depletion, which is allowing transposable elements to um, become activated. I didn't show you um, all of the data connecting all of these dots, but we think that um, it causes an abortive activation of the cell cycle in neurons, which then kills the neurons. Um, so right now we're working on a lot of studies in mouse, uh, using mouse brains and human brains uh, to see how well conserved the fly system is uh, to, to the mammalian system. Um, we know that transposable element activation is druggable. So we have the clinical starting up. And then a major focus of the lab is on how transposable element activation drives neuroinflammation. I told you before that the, ex, that the episomal DNA and the proteins that are made from transposable elements, also double-stranded RNAs that are made from transposable elements, can be recognized as viral by the cell. So we're really working on how transposable element activation could also drive inflammation. All right, so um, this is my lab. The Transposable Element Project was really spearheaded by Dr. Winyan Sun. She did all of the early work in flies um, and humans. I kind of uh, acknowledged everyone as I was going along. You saw their pictures um, come up on this slide, but um, Paul is now doing a lot of the bioinformatics work uh, for human, mouse, and fly um, transposable element analysis. Gabby's uh, really leading the clinical trial in my lab. Um, I've had great collaborators at my, at my own institution. Um, we got mouse brains from, um, and mouse RNA sequencing data from Wei Kao. Uh, Nilou Furtainer um, generated the human RNA sequencing data that's, available, that's publicly available um, via the AMP-AD project. This is a great resource for anyone wanting to do omics using publicly available data sets from Alzheimer's disease, a bunch of other neurodegenerative disorders, as well as um, mouse models and other models. Um, our human brain tissue, we get from Dr. Um, Dennis Dixon at the Mayo Clinic. We get brain tissue um, and RNA sequencing data also from our collaborators at MD Anderson um, and Mass General Hospital. So this is all the funding that has gone into not just the data that I showed you, but the whole transposable element project in my lab. Um, it's currently funded by uh, an RF1 from the National Institute on Aging. Um, so that's the, the major short source of funding right now for the project. So that's my last slide and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, this is, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. I'm pretty sure I need to go back to it to watch again, to get a grasp of some of the things that was mentioned. So thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Um, 
we'll start with a question from uh, Zunji. Uh, yeah, it says, hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. I have two questions. Are retrotransposons activated in neurons or glial cells by tau party? And two, or should we first answer that before? Let's answer the, that first before we go to the second question. Sure, yes. So our published analysis and everything that I showed you so far was with RNA sequencing data was in total brain lysates. So based on what I've showed you, I can't, based on this data, I can't show you, I cannot tell you whether it's neurons or glia. When we're looking at the transposable element jumping, so actually the new insertions that are happening, that reporter was only being expressed in the neurons. So while the transposable element jumping could be happening, happening in glia, we were not set up um, to actually see that happening. Um, so that being said, we've, uh, Paul in my lab has recently started looking at transposable element RNA levels in um, single nucleus sequencing data. Um, and we do see big differences between neurons and glia. Um, that's very preliminary and I don't want to like share the result, but yes, there, there are big differences in neurons and glia in terms of transposable, it seems, um, at least in the data set that he's analyzed so far. Um, yeah, so Fantastic. that'll be coming soon. Okay, cool. <laughs> Actually, it probably won't be coming very soon. It'll take us a while to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, and the second question said, uh, different tau mouse models show ERVs, uh, ERVs activation at different time points. Is ERVs activation prior to the dementia happen for these mice? Prior to like cognitive impairment? Well, yeah, I would say that may, because it's ambiguous, dementia. So let's say cognitive impairment, yeah, in the mice. Yeah, it was interesting looking at the three mouse models because mm -hmm. in the RTG 4510s, at the RNA level, we saw that transposable elements were elevated pretty late, you know, after, after neurodegeneration. However, mm -hmm. In the JNPL3s, we see that the transposable elements are activated at the RNA level, you know, I think prior to, or like right at tau tangle formation and prior to, to neurodegeneration. And then in the PS19s, it's about the same time as neurodegeneration. So that's at the RNA level. Mm. So we were actually a little bit disappointed in the tau transgenic mice, mm. the RNA seq data from the RTG 4510s because it looks like the transposable element active, like RNA levels weren't being increased until after neurodegeneration. So maybe mm -hmm. it's like a consequence of neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. But we've looked at um, protein that comes from, that's encoded by transposable elements. Mm -hmm. And we've looked at, we've analyzed um, DNA copy number of retrotransposons as well. And we see increase in retrotransposon protein levels and increase in DNA copy level copy number of retrotransposons at a much earlier age in the um, in that level. So it's kind of um, it looks like those change, changes are happening before uh, the changes that we see at the RNA level. Mm -hmm. We think that that's because um, the at the RNA level it's it, it's muddy because we're looking at a total brain lysate. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps, you know, a major increase it's happening in neurons at the RNA level and a major decrease is happening in microglia at the RNA level. And so you're kind of like covering up the signal that you, that you should be getting at those earlier ages, mm -hmm. which we can, we can see the difference at an earlier age. If we stain for those proteins, um, we can see the increase in neurons. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, I also wanted to ask about this uh, timing because I think in the same model, uh, in about six months or so, the Malichus group have shown that you see decreased protein synthesis, which could be linked to the uh, uh, unfolded protein uh, synthesis, uh, unfolded stress response part. We I can't really remember now. Yeah, uh, so which is kind of interesting because you'll be wanting to say, okay, is it really happening before all these protein synthesis or tau tangle, uh, you know, deposition, or is it after that? But in terms of uh, human. AD uh, uh, brain tissue, have you looked at different stages? In which ones do you see uh, some of these changes? Yes, so the RNA sequencing data that I showed in the presentation, that was a total brain lysate from late stage Alzheimer's disease. So it was Brock stage five, six brains. Oh, okay. So they have a lot of tau, the highest amount of tau. I see, I see. We've also looked at uh, Brock stage three brains. Mm -hmm. So that would be like a moderate, it goes from Brock zero to Brock mm -hmm. 
five, uh, six, which is like how much tau is in the brain. Mm. We've looked, as you, I know you know, um, but at Brock stage three, which is an earlier phase, mm. we have analyzed um, transposable element DNA copy number as like a proxy for activation. Like I told you, whenever there's a mobilization event for retrotransposons, you get an extra DNA copy. So we see a big increase in retrotransposon DNA copy in Brock stage three brains. So typically people who are Brock stage three don't have cognitive impairment yet. So it seems like in the humans that it's happening pretty early. Yeah, which is kind of cool because then hopefully the clinical trials going on might be you know, you could say it might hopefully be hard, be good, you know? Yeah. There's uh, a lot of failure. I mean, it's like 99.99% failure yeah. for all clinical trials, but, you know, someday something will Yeah, exactly. One work. Thing <laughs> <does that. laughs> okay, so um, there's this question, which is exactly something that I wanted to ask, but uh, the question is, does the history of HIV or other retroviruses infection affect the disease cause of tauopathies? And uh, just to add, because if you remember, there is this um, recent, you know, theory about AD development, you know, like herpes virus, ETC. So I also wanted to just ask whether there is any way those viruses could be, you know, having uh, impact on the disease development. But in this particular question, yeah. does the history of HIV or other retroviruses infection affect the disease cause of the hepatitis? So. Right. So there's a there's a cognitive syndrome that goes along with HIV, but it's not a tauopathy. Mm. Um, I know that there is an effort right now that is not published to mm. look at patients with HIV who have been prescribed um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors to see mm. if they had a better, like basically less incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but that study isn't published yet. I was really concerned initially with the clinical trial with 3TC because um, there's some evidence that the cognitive problems mm -hmm. with HIV could be a consequence of the, the therapies that people are um, being prescribed. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the positive effects of 3TC in the clinical trials with Acardi Gutierrez syndrome and ALS uh, made me less you know, concerned about that. But there's not, there is not association as far as I'm aware of HIV and tauopathy. Like if you have HIV, mm. I don't think you're at higher risk for tauopathy, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, do you think if you just find like cell culture models and uh, infect them with, let's say, half virus, do you think that would have some impact on the, uh, uh, you know, what you see? I mean, this is just. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know I know that uh, people infected organoids with COVID nineteen and it caused uh, tau, you know, yeah. hyperphosphorylation. Mm -hmm. I kind of suspect that if you're, I mean, I, I don't know, but I kind of think if you're stressing out cells in any, it, you yeah, know, like a lot of different types of stresses could cause <laughs> tau to become like hyperphosphorylated and potentially aggregated in cell systems. Yeah. Um, but to really know like how long that tau would Mm. hang around um and if it's actually happening in human i think yeah in human studies yeah. cool okay so we've got this question it said um i'm wondering so sorry for the facebook guys i haven't really checked whether there's any uh, question on facebook and we haven't really got much time so i'll probably just focus on zoom um so this question said i'm wondering if you could talk a little more about retro transposon mobilization in somatic cells for example in a human who progressively develops tauopathy, who there will there be somatic retrotransposons activation in non-dividing neurons where pathogenic tau is present significantly affecting neuronal gene expression? It's kind of long, but have you got the question? Yes, got it. Yeah. Um, so that is a major question for us in the lab to try, try we're, that we're trying to figure out right now because most retrotransposons in humans are not thought to be able to to mobilize anymore there are a, there are some like some members of line one and alu families that still retain mobilization um potential uh, but we we don't know for sure if they're doing that in the human brain. Mm. So one piece of evidence that we do have is that we know the retrotransposons that are elevated at the DNA level, which is consistent in the human brain, which is consistent with actually actual moving 
in the somatic cells of the human brain, but we don't know if that DNA is actually, is episomal, like extra chromosomal, or if it's actually inserted into the DNA. Mm -hmm. So to determine if it's actually inserted into the DNA, we're doing, uh, we have, we're piloting two approaches. So we're doing pack bio based, um, actually we switched to nanopore, nanopore based um, long read sequencing from human brain to identify novel insertions in somatic cells. Mm -hmm. And then we're also trying a single neuronal nucleus DNA sequencing wow. um, to try also to identify somatic insertions. The issue, like there's a lot of controversy in the transposable element field about the best way to, to do these analyses. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you can't just take a human brain and isolate DNA and then sequence it because each mobilization event is stochastic. So mm -hmm. you're only gonna have it happen into a particular genomic lo location once. So mm -hmm. if you're just sequencing DNA in a normal way, that's gonna get covered up by all of you know, the other DNA. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, we're working very hard on that right now. That's a major focus of the lab is to see if the extra DNA is actually inserting. If we find that it doesn't really, like that, that those extra retrotransposon DNA copies don't really insert, then mm -hmm. it's possible that the transposable element induced inflammation may be playing a bigger role than the potential novel insertion, somatic insertions that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, so we will see. Cool. Um, we've got another question. I've got actually lots of questions, but we don't have time. So, um, uh, well, I won't be selfish since I'm the moderator. So this question <laughs> said, <laughs> is there any half family which is particularly overexpressed in tau pathogenic cells or models? Or is it a general unspecific phenomenon? General slash unspecific phenomenon? Is there a specific transposable element family that's activated? Yeah. Yeah, um, it seems like in, I mean, we see lines and we see um, endogenous retroviruses. It seems like across the model systems that the endogenous retrovirus family are uh, particularly elevated at the RNA level. Um, mm -hmm. That has really popped out. But in terms of DNA copy number, um, we see line, some line ones that are elevated at the DNA level as well. Mm. Oh, cool. Uh, I mean, I haven't really done this, but uh, uh, it would be interesting to see, uh, you know, because we did, with, with the impact of tau on heterochromatin and everything, it would be interesting to see where, with the pathogenic tau, whether you're actually seeing less binding of tau in the heterochromatin, which is allowing them to become more loose, which leads to the different changes that you see. I mean, it, yeah, this is something cool that could be done, and uh, it's really interesting. Yeah. What, what the, so that one of the ways, one of, yeah, one of the ways that we could do that is um, in in the fly model. If we knock down fly, like not a tau transgenic fly, but if we mm -hmm. knock down fly tau, and then use our nano string code set to see if transposable, if it's like the same transposable elements that are activated, mm -hmm. that would suggest that what we're seeing in the tau transgenic model might also be a consequence of loss of normal tau, normal fly tau function. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. Or in human yeah. cells, in human cells, if we knock down tau and look at transposable element changes, that'd be cool. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Or maybe look at uh, in the tau party model, do some IV on nuclear extract as well with chromatin markers to see what happens uh, with tau binding in those regions and related to the activation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's, it's so sad that we have come, to, it's five o'clock now. I've got lots of questions like, how does a beta fit with tau and the activation? And uh, in your you know, past work, you've shown how oxidative stress could also be linked to some of these changes. So I wonder whether you've also pursued that line of work, but I guess uh, we have to end it here. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Yeah, do you have any last word before I kind of wrap it up? No, th thank you really. Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, I really appreciate all the questions. It's, it's exciting when I give a talk and people are really interested and ask questions. So it feels good. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, unfortunately, those on Facebook, we couldn't really go back to look at the questions. But yeah, I really want to thank you on behalf of the uh, Sec General of the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa and all our other uh, organizations, all the other organizations that we do this together with, and uh, 
all the members of SONA and everyone that joined this webinar today. I mean, I really enjoyed the talk. The talk would be uh, posted on YouTube, so it will be there for people to go back and watch. And I'm sure uh, Bears will be happy to respond to questions if there is any. Sure, um, just email me if you have questions. I'm on the internet. Great, great. <laughs> so thank you so much for honoring this invitation and uh, speak to you again sometime soon. Yes. All right. Thank you. Bye, All everyone. Right, bye.